Welcome back and welcome to LearnControlSystems.com. In this video we're going to talk about control valve sizing. We're going to talk about how you size a valve, the pressure you need to make the valve work, when to use a linear valve, and when to use an equal percentage valve. And we'll talk about what the equations are, the ISA 75 standard control valve sizing equations, and what the variables mean, and what you put in and then we'll look at how to size the valve. We'll also look at real life applications and real life uh, how you do this in real life and how the control valves don't quite work the way most people teach how they work. Uh, they don't follow these curves that you see on these graphs. That's off the shelf and instead we're going to look at a real installed valve. We're going to focus on control valve sizing in this video. Uh, the first section of this video will be sizing control valves for the CSE professional engineers exam. Um, there's not much to the exam. Uh, you just basically typically will have uh, a valve in one service and they'll give you the parameters and you'll calculate the CV from those parameters and then they'll say based on that CV will it work in another service and you'll have to calculate for that service to make sure it works and that's about all there is on the exam but in real life we need to understand how these work so we're going to focus on when to use a linear valve when to use an equal percentage valve uh, and we'll talk about the resistance of the pipe and how to size these valves for real installations uh, it's not as simple as they give you a DP and you size it uh, you have to be sure your DP is correct for all the operating parameters. Uh, typically, you're going to be over a range. So you'll pick a normal operating range, uh, a flow rate, and then you'll pick 20 or 30 percent above that and 20 or 30 percent below that. Uh, and this is for upset, so you can regulate your flow. And you can increase the flow and decrease the flow to maintain your upsets. And so typically, we're going to use uh, 20 percent minimum. Uh, up to 60 to 80 percent of our valve but we never use below 10 percent or above 80 percent of our valve because it's just you just can't control it it's like a car you don't want to be no gas and all gas you want to regulate your car to drive around town and this is where we have to size the valve correctly so we get a good operating range and we respond and the gain of the system will be at a point where you're not oscillating up and down and your valve's not going up and down, up and down, and you can control it pretty steady and keep a good steady flow rate. Okay, let's get started on control valve sizing. Okay, uh, these are the ISA 75 standard. Uh, it comes from the ISA 75 standard, and these are the typical valve sizing equations. Uh, you'll see one for liquid, one for gas and vapor, and one for steam. Uh, these have a, a number in here called N1. And N1 is just, you look it up in the table, they have coefficients for these valves for the N1, the N6, the N7. And you look it up, and depending on what you're trying to do, whether you're doing English units or SI units, uh, it says what these variables will be. And so Q, like Q, uh, in, in this video you're going to watch, it'll say FV, but Q, Q for here would be, for liquid, would be gallons per minute. So for N1, it's PSIA and uh, gallons per minute, and N1 equals 1. So you can just ignore N1, typically, uh, when we're doing our liquid sizing. For our gas and vapor flow, we have N7, and uh, for standard cubic foot per hour, and PSIA, N7 equals 1360. And uh, on the steam flow, N6 for PSIA and pounds per hour, N6 equals 63.3. And these will be the variables you use uh, when you're calculating this. Now, uh, you'll see the F sub P. F sub P is the piping geometric factor. Uh, you need to learn how to do this. It's in the book. 
uh, it'll be in the second video, the second sizing video will be from Fisher Control Valve and they'll show you how to size the, the piping geometric factor for this. It's the correction factor for when you reduce down, the valve is actually a size or half the size of the pipe. So typically it's a size smaller than the pipe. It could be half the size of the pipe. And uh, this is the correct for when your fluid's accelerating through the valve and coming back out and deaccelerating. Uh, it's Bernoulli coefficients. And um, so if we look at the gas, we look at the gas, we got a Y also. And a Y is your uh, gas expansion coefficient. So uh, on the exam, they're not going to give you a, a valve in a pipe they'll say there's a service and what's the coefficient of the valve c sub v but they're not going to you're not going to have to calculate f sub p so you can ignore that but you can't ignore the y the coefficient of expansion on the exam you'll have to calculate the coefficient of expansion and they have that in the 2022 reference handbook they have these formulas for you so be familiar with your handbook so you can calculate these. Okay, uh, C sub V just means that it comes from the valve coefficient table in the valves, but you won't have a valve coefficient table uh, to go by. You're going to calculate what the CV required is, and then to do actual valve sizing, you would look up what the CV is in the table and find out where it is in the table. And typically, you want your, for normal flow, you want your CV for normal flow when you're throttling to be approximately 50% of the CV of the table. In other words, 50% of the maximum CV of the valve. And CV just means that there's one gallon a minute flowing through it with one PSI across the valve. And uh, so in other words, if you had uh, 10 gallons a minute flowing through there, with one PSI across the valve, you would have 10 CV. If you had 100 gallons a minute flowing through the valve with one PSI differential across it, you would have 100 CV. Okay, um, so on the first formula, the liquid formula, it's just CV times the square root of delta P. And it doesn't matter if it's a gauge or absolute, it's just the difference of the pressure in the pressure in, if you look on the valve on the right hand side, it's the upstream pressure, pressure in, minus the downstream pressure exiting pressure two. And so it's the delta P. And there's no, it doesn't matter, it's differential, it doesn't matter if it's a gauge or absolute. And that's over the Pacific gravity flowing, G sub F. And that's the Pacific gravity of the liquid flowing uh, at the flowing conditions. The basic equation for gas and vapor flow is uh, we have F sub P, which we can ignore, C sub V, which we're going to calculate, <clears throat> Q will be in standard cubic feet per hour, so it'll give you like standard cubic feet per hour, and you solve for C V. Uh, P1 is pressure absolute, so if they give you a gauge pressure, you have to add 14.7, PSI to it to get absolute pressure, the atmospheric pressure to it. You add 14.7. X is just delta P over pressure 1 absolute. G sub F again is just your Pacific gravity flowing. Uh, T sub 1 <clears throat> is your Rankine temperature for us. It'll be temperature in Rankine. So you'll take your temperature plus uh, 460. So like if it was at standard uh, standard pressure and temperature, which would be 60 uh, degrees, it'd be 60 degrees plus 460, and your temperature would be 520. Compressibility uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, compressibility is ignored. Uh, we don't have really have any compressibility. When it's flowing, for most people say when it's flowing, uh, just consider compressibility as one. Now on the um, equation for steam flow, uh, again we have CV, same CV, Y, and 
N6, N6 is going to be 63.3 for PSIA in pounds per hour, and typically they're going to give you steam in pounds per hour. And then uh, X is just delta P over P1 absolute. P1 is pressure in absolute. That's pressure in absolute. And gamma sub uh, F, gamma sub 1, it is actually um, your reciprocal. You look in the steam tables, and in the saturated steam tables, you get your Pacific volume, and you take the reciprocal of that, and you go from uh, cubic feet per pound to pound per cubic feet, and it'll be your pound per cubic foot. Okay, now why? Uh, y is the same on both, and y equals 1 minus x all over 3k over 1.4 times x sub t. And 1.4 uh, is your uh, heat ratio of air, and k will be like for a gas or steam, 1.3. So it would be 3 times 1.3 over 1.4 times x sub t. X sub t would typically be looked up in a table from the valve coefficients, and it'll have x sub t in there. Uh, but you're not going to have valve coefficient tables. So the general uh, average is about uh, 0.64. So x sub t is 0 0.64. Just put in 0 0.64, and it's such a minute uh, difference in value that it hardly matters, and you'll get the correct answer. Now, all these formulas are in your NCEES reference handbook. Um, just look it up, and I'll have the values for Y and the control valve formulas. Now, remember, when we're sizing these valves, we want to, the golden rule is size the valve for 200% CV. That means that your CV of normal throttling it should be right around 50% of the CV of the linear or equal percentage valve. You should be throttling about in the middle of your CV, not middle of your stroke, not 50% stroke, but approximately 50% CV. And uh, that means the valve is going to be almost 200% times normal uh, CV for normal flow. And um, that has to do with the pressure drop. Uh, now, you got this picture of these valves off the shelf. You get the curve of the valve travel versus the CV of the valve. But when you take this linear and it looks like a straight line going up, an equal percentage looks like an X squared curve coming up, and that's off the shelf. That's not installed. When you install these into the pipe, uh, you have pressure drops in these pipes. And if we studied fluids, go back and study fluids if you miss this, uh, the faster you flow, the more the pressure drops, because the pressure drops proportional to the velocity squared. And with a pump, the pump, as you increase flow, the pressure of the pump drops off as well. So we have a pressure drop increasing in the pipe, and we have pressure drop dropping out of the pump, head of the pump, and we have less and less differential pressure as we speed up. And so you have less and less pressure. We have less and less pressure to go across the valve as a differential pressure to drive the fluid through it. And so therefore the CV uh, at low end is very low with high pressure. And at the high flow end, this, the uh, CV is high in an equal percentage valve, but your DP is low. And so this tends to linearize out the curve the squared curve becomes more linear, and it kind of looks like an S-curve. So the equal percentage valve looks more like a um, linear valve, and a linear valve starts moving towards a quick opening valve. And uh, the linear valve is not well suited for uh, typical applications. For most applications, we'll use an equal percentage valve. Uh, the linear valve is good if you have a constant head like a tank above it where you're maintaining a level and you have a constant head all the time and you have a short run of pipe where there's not much change in the pressure drop the linear valve is well suited but when you have a pump and a long run you need to use an equal percentage valve uh, in the video you watch here uh, this teacher of chemical engineering will show you uh, typical applications 
and he's already done it, so there's no use me uh, putting together. He's already got the graphics together to explain it. So remember, 50% of your CV, not your stroke, not the stem stroke, 50% of the CV. So 50% CV uh, is what you want to use. It's the golden rule. Another thing is, uh, with a CV, on a linear percentage valve, you never want to go below 10% of your CV. And on an equal percentage valve, never go below 20% of your CV. Now that's CV max of the maximum CV. And on the linear and the equal percentage valve, never go above approximately 70 to 80%. Somewhere around 75% maximum to 80% maximum. This is because when the pressure drops off, the uh, times the CV, the pressure times the CV, the gallons per minute curve drops off and levels out, tends to almost level out, and you just really don't get any increase in flow at all. And so uh, I pretty much agree with everything the man says in here uh, in the video, except he's a little confused about the part of, a, it, he makes it sound like he's saying 50% stem stroke, and again, 50% CV. So we can only use approximately 20 to 80% of our valve CV out of our tables to make it function properly. Remember when you install this in a real process and you have an upset or a set point change, the valve has to overshoot. And so it overshoots and it goes way up and way down. So on low flows, your valve will tend to bottom out and beat itself to death. And on a high flow, it'll tend to max out and you won't get any more flow to correct. Let's watch the video and see how this works. Hello. How's everyone doing today? In this video, we're going to discuss control valves and how to design a control valve for a given control process where the valve is the final control. In most chemical process control systems, the manipulated variable is a flow rate, so the final control element is a flow valve. The components of the valve, or the actuator system, include the valve body, the valve plug and stem, and the valve actuator. Okay, there are three main types of control valves. Quick opening is the first one, and this is primarily used for safety bypass, and it doesn't typically work to control systems. We'll discuss why that is in a few slides. And throughout the rest of this video, we're going to discuss the differences between equal percentage and linear valves. Uh, the first important point is that the size of the equal percentage, or the size of the linear valve, is going to determine the maximum flow that goes through the body, the, the valve body. So again, the, the primary thing that we need in terms of designing a control valve is we need a valve that's big enough to accommodate our maximum allowable flow. And that will be something that's fairly straightforward to determine. Okay, the most common way to express valve performance is using the term CV, which is the valve coefficient. Okay, so the definition, the, the or CV is, is, is the relationship between the flow rate and the pressure drop across the valve, and it's based on the following relationship. So the flow is equal to K, which is a constant, times CV, times the square root of delta P over the density. Okay, and so in this equation, K is, is a unit conversion. So K is going to convert the units between um, the flow, CV, or the flow, the pressure, and the density. To make things easy, we can use a value of K equal to 1 if the CV is gallons per minute, delta P is PSI, and rho is specific gravity. Okay, so as long as we use these terms, and then finally, if, if we have water or something close to water, SG equals 1, right? And we'll use that for many design type scenarios. Then this equation is going to simplify to FV equals CV times square root of delta V. All right, so now here it's very easy to see that CV is the relationship between the flow rate and the square root of the pressure in the system. So importantly, 
U.S. vendors are going to um, report the values for CV based on these types of units as well. So um, it's, it's in your interest to be comfortable working with flow rates in gallons per minute and pressure drops in terms of PSI. For linear, for, for linear globe valves, CV versus percent open is pretty easy. It's going to be based on the valve size. And you can, based on the valve size, you can get CV max, which is the maximum valve coefficient when the valve is entirely open. Uh, for this, for, for our class or for other purposes, you can typically use a, a CV max that you get from a table that, that may be given for equal percentage valves, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so for linear valves, if we want to know CV as a function of X, CV as a function of X is going to be equal to CV max. All right, this might be given times X over 100. So when X equals 0, the valve is entirely closed and CV is 0. There's no flow. When X is equal to 100, the valve is entirely open and the CV is equal to the maximum CV that can be delivered from the valve. Okay, well, to do a, a quick example here, if we have a 4-inch valve, and from the table in the textbook we can get a CV max equals 190, right? If the valve is 65% open, Right, then we can get the valve coefficient CV equals 190 times 65 over 100 and this is equal to 123.5. Alright, so essentially from, from here, valve, this is for a linear valve, if we plot CV versus X, we get something, we get CV that goes from 0 to CV max when the valve is 100% open. Linear valves are used when the pressure drop across the system is fairly constant, and that means with flow. Right, so what that would mean is that the line losses are typically small, the pressure generated from, or whatever the driving force is for the flow is fairly constant. So this could be something like a uh, gravity-driven flow where you have a constant uh, hydrostatic head above the control valve. For equal percentage valves, the CV versus percent open must be found in, in a table. Um, in the textbook, table 2.1 is shown here for a variety of different body size valves going from 1 up to 4 inches. For linear, if we're doing linear valves, we can just go to 100% open and we can use this to get CV max for a linear valve of the same size. All right, so for equal percentage valves, to get CV as a function to get CV as a function of X, we're going to have to use this table and potentially even linear interpolate between values on this table. Okay, so one of the main differences is for equal percentage valves, if we plot CV as a function of X, right, for linear valves, we said that the CV is linear with X from 0 to 100%. So for equal percentage valves, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. Equal percentage valves will have more of an <coughs> more of an exponential shape associated with them. At low flows, the CV won't change much when the valve opens, whereas at high flows, the CV is going to change quite a bit when valves opens. And so the purpose of this is to get fairly constant changes in flow rate for changes in valve position. The next thing we want to discuss is the inherent valve characteristics. And this is the performance of a valve if the delta P is constant, so there's no change in pressure across the valve. Okay, if we look at how the inherent valve characteristics work for the three different types of valves, we'll see for quick opening. For quick opening valves, what we can see is that immediately the valve opens up and the flow is almost entirely established, or it's established very quickly. Um, in, in many cases, depending on the design of a quick opening valve, it can even be greater than the performance shown here. Okay, this next curve is pretty easy to determine what it is. 
This is a linear valve where the performance or where the slope of the fraction of the full flow, which is related to CV, is constant with stem position. Because remember, from our relationship, FV equals CV times delta P, if this term is constant, then your flow is proportional to your CV. Okay, for equals percentage valves, it's shown here. Uh, I want to point out that this point right here should probably go through, does go through zero rather than how it's shown on here. So I'll draw that on here a little bit better. Okay, so for a, a C, for an equal percentage valve, the CV changes only a little bit initially at low valve positions and changes by quite a bit at high valve positions. So again, CV, or the flow is proportional to CV, so we can think about this as CV in addition to a uh, fraction of the full flow. Right, and th this is an example of the inherent valve characteristics for each one. So what you can see here is that if you have a system that has a fairly constant pressure drop, your best valve for getting the control over the entire range of flow is to use the linear valve. Because for your linear valve, what you can see is you always have a constant change in flow as you change your valve position. So let's consider a case where we have a constant delta P. And a constant delta P might come, come from a system where you have gravity-driven flow. So here's an example of a storage tank. that has a fairly constant liquid level. It's always about 30 feet above the valve. So the, the pressure generated by this storage tank is related to rho GH. Right, so this, if the height's constant, this should give us a constant driving force or constant pressure driving force across this valve. The also important assumption to consider here are that the line losses are low or small for the system. Right, so if the line losses are small, and uh, the pressure generated by the pressure of the, based on the height of the fluid is constant, we would expect to have a relatively constant pressure drop across the valve. And if this is the case, like we mentioned, a linear valve is probably best. So let's see how that works. So the first thing we want to do is to set up a plot of the pressure drop versus flow rate for a variety of components in the system. So here on the y-axis we have pressure change, on the x-axis we have flow rate. So in, in this figure we're going to plot a couple different things. First we're going to plot the pressure, and so this is the pressure of the hydrostatic head, and so this right here it's based on the height of the fluid. Okay, the other thing we will need to calculate in the system is the line losses. We said the line losses were low, but in order to get an accurate measurement of the of this, um, an actual accurate description of the valve performance, we need to determine what the line losses are. These line losses are all pressure losses in the system except the valve. That could be from the permanent losses in the orifice plate meter, skin friction of the flow in the pipe, elbows, etc. Okay, so if we take the difference, we can get delta P of the valve, and the delta P of the valve is the difference between the delta P of the hydrostatic head and the delta P of the line losses. Once we have, once we calculate the delta P through the valve, we can go back to our equation from previous where we have flow equals CV times square root of delta P over SG, and again as long as we're in GPM and PSI, this will work. So already we have data for the flow rate and we have data for the pressure drop across the valve and we should know the specific gravity based on the fluid, based on all that. We can now calculate the CV versus flow rate and based on the performance of the valve or based on the flow performance of the type of valve, so based on size and the type of valve, we can generate a plot that shows flow versus X. 
Right, and so that's what we want to do. On this slide, we're now looking at the installed characteristics of the valve, or installed valve characteristics. And this is going to be for four inch linear and four inch equal percentage valves. So again, the way the, the way that we constructed this plot was was this installed flow rate shown here. These are specified flow rates over which we want the system to operate. So these we can consider these as an essentially given. Right? So given the flow rates, we calculated the the pressure generated based on the hydrostatic head. We calculated the pressure losses associated with the lines and we got the delta P through the valve. Based on the delta P through the valve, we were able to calculate CV using FV equals K, actually K equals 1, delta P over SG. And then using the valve, so for the valve, CV equals X over 100 times CV max for linear, or CV equals values for the table for equal percentage. All right, so using those values, we're able to calculate X, which is now given down here on the bottom. So X is the percent open. So these values were calculated for the given flow rates, which had corresponding um, pressure losses, etc. Okay, so if we now, now using this, using this data for the installed flow rate plotted versus uh, stem position, we can identify which valve would work best for this given system. <clears throat> if we look at the linear valve, what we see is over a range of about 10% open up to about 85, maybe 90% open, we see that the valve performance is fairly linear with respect, with, with effect, or with respect to the percent open. Whereas the equal percentage valve, what we see is initially the valve, the flow rate doesn't change very much as we open the valve, and then it changes quite a bit. So really with the equal percentage, we effectively only have control of the flow over a very small range. So based on these properties, what we can see is that the linear valve would be much more suitable for this application than an equal percentage flow valve. Okay, let's switch, let's switch gears now and look at a more common application, which is a, uh, a flow that's driven by a pump. So the difference here is that when flow is driven by a pump, the pressure generated by the pump is a strong function of the flow rate required. So as, we, as you increase the flow rate required by the pump, the pressure generated by the pump is going to decrease. This change in pressure associated with the flow rate is going to have a, a big impact in how the valve performs or, or how the flow responds to changes in valve positions for the different types of valves. All right, so the example that we'll show is here, and again, the only thing that's important is that, you know, again, we have a pump that's used to drive the flow. So in this case, we're, we're pumping the liquid flow from the accumulator back into the top of a distillation column, perhaps. All right, so just like last time, we have to first start by generating a plot of pressure drop versus flow rate. Okay, and again, we're going to do that. We have pressure on the y-axis as a function of flow rates. And again, this is just the flow rate, this is just a range of flow rates that we might want to investigate for the particular application. Okay, so the first delta P that we have is going to come from the pump. Okay, so in order to determine the delta P from the pump, we need to use pump curves. And the pump curves can, will typically be uh, found in literature or supplied by the manufacturer of the pump. So the, the pump head, this is data that may be supplied by the manufacturer, so we have to find this somewhere. Okay, the next thing we need to look at, just like in the previous case, are the delta P associated with the line losses. The delta P associated with the line losses, this can be things like skin friction. We can have elbows. We can have orifice plate. And this is something that's used to measure the flow. 
And again, when we consider the pressure drop from the orifice plate, we only have to consider the permanent pressure drop and not the pressure drop that's immediately across the orifice plate that's used to determine the flow rate. Other things that can affect the delta P losses in the system are if you have a change in pressure from your source, from from, from your source to the destination, if you have a height change, if the fluid undergoes a, a change in height, we have to consider those pressures as well. And we typically group, we just group all of those terms into delta P of the line loss. So any pressure term from the mechanical energy balance that is not considered, or that, that is not the valve. All right, so finally, we can just subtract the pressure generated from the pump with the delta P of the line losses, and this gives us our delta P associated with the valve. And you can see here that because the delta, the pressure generated by the pump decreases with increasing flow rate, we have a much stronger change in, change in pressure across the valve as a function of flow rate in this range. One thing you'll notice is that the valve delta P will eventually go to zero. Now it can't go exactly to zero once the line losses um, are equal to the, the, the pressure generated by the pump. You just can't get any more flow rate through the system. Okay, so next thing we want to do is, again, follow the same process that we used last time. Here we have a valve delta P, and down here we have flow rate. And again, good, we have things in our proper units. So using this, we can use our equation FV equals CV, square root of delta P over SG. And this will allow us to calculate CV over this whole range of flow rates. Using the calculation of CV, again, we can, based on the valve, we can get X. Right? For the linear, it's straightforward. For the equal percentage, we'll use the table. Now we're back to the plot of the installed valve characteristics for the pump-driven flow system. Again, we have the flow rates, and these are given. These would be flow rates where we would target operating our system. If we wanted a bigger flow rate range, we would have to vary the range, etc. The stem position, this is our x. We calculate the stem position from the stem position comes from CV, which is calculated from the previous plot using the relationship between flow and pressure drop across the valve. Okay, if we calculate that now for the pump-driven flow system, we can see two different characteristics. For the linear valve, we see installed characteristics that look as shown here. And then for the equal percentage valve, we see the characteristics shown here. One of the things to point out is that neither of these valves work particularly well above 80% open. So typically one of the heuristics, heuristic rules in designing a valve is valves are never designed to work when open greater than 80-85% because there's no control really over the flow when a valve is nearly fully open. Also, valves typically aren't designed to operate below about 15% when valves are below about 15% or so, the, the valve stem will make contact with the valve seat and eventually wear and erode the body of the valve and cause it to need to be replaced um, at a higher rate. Okay, so what do we notice for these two conditions? What we can see here now, the equal percentage valve, it has a little bit of a change in slope to it, but we see a fairly uh, constant change in flow rate with respect to stem position, whereas for the linear valve, at low positions, from about 10% up to about 40%, we have the most change, but for anything above 40 to 80% or 30 to 80%, here there is no uh, effect on the flow. So for pump-driven flow systems, where, is, where there is a large change in where there is a large change in pressure drop across the valve, equal percentage valves typically gives you a better performance than a linear control valve. Let's spend a couple minutes on control valve sizing. So when we size a control valve, we want to typically start with the uh, average flow rate that we expect to go through the flow valve. And we want that average flow rate to be somewhere um, operated with a valve position somewhere between 50 and 70% open. And that's just a general rule of thumb. 
over all of the, we want to make sure that the valve is open at least 15% and no more than about 80% over the entire range of flow required. So at the minimum flow rate, the valve should be opened at least 15%, and at the maximum flow rate, the valve should be open no more than 85%. So typically, we can use these two, uh, these two guidelines to identify a valve that works best for a given process. Now, if none of these can work, there are other options that we can do. Later on, we'll talk about split flow control, where we have a small valve and a large valve that work together. Um, and also, if you identify more valves multiple valves that can work for a given system, you might have to use your judgment. So if you care about minimizing the cost, you might go with a smaller valve. If you want to allow for an increased capacity later, you might use a slightly larger valve. Typically the smaller valves are going to be a little bit better because they'll give you, um, they'll give you more precise changes in flow with changes in valve position because you're using more of the range of the valve to achieve the target ranges of flow within your given process. Okay, I'm going to come back to this slide so that we can go through a quick example on selecting a control valve. So I don't have a lot of room on this slide, but I'm going to write some information. So we want to select a control valve that gives us a maximum flow of 180 gallons per minute. minimum flow of 30 gallons per minute. It's a pump driven process, so we're going to use a pump driven process. right? So this pump driven process pretty much tells us that we want to have equal percentage valve. Right, so we're going to use this plot for the performance of the system. So this curve right here is going to tell us this is our actual pump that we're going to use in the process. Someone else did the dirty work and calculated these line losses for us, and so these are going to be the line losses that we'll use. So we need to use a we need to have a valve, our valve, we need to select a valve that's going to give us this range of delta P across the valve over a flow rate range of about 30 up to 180. Okay, so for the equal percentage valve, we'll use table 2.1, and I can go back to that valve table in, in just a second. Okay, so first we want to know what is our delta P across the valve at the minimum and maximum flow rate. So at the minimum flow rate, our delta P, if I read this off the plot, uh, maybe that's between about 19 and 20, so I'll say 19.5 at our minimum. At our maximum flow rate, we're somewhere around here. Okay, if I read this, if I draw this over here, maybe this is about 6.5 PSI. Now ultimately what I would want to do is not necessarily read these values off the chart, but use the tabulated data so I get a better idea about what that actual pressure drop across the valve is. Okay, so now that I know these pressure drops, I need to calculate the CV min. Right, so the CV min, this is going to be equal to the flow rate, which is 30 gallons per minute over a square root of 19.5. Right, and in this case, actually, I'm, I didn't say earlier, but we're going to assume we have water as our fluid. Okay, so I just rearranged our equation that relates flow, CV, and delta P. And we can calculate a CV min of, this would be 6.8. And again, we can also calculate CV um, at the max flow. I'm going to write CV max F, not to be confused with the maximum CV of the valve. All right, so this is going to be 180 divided by square root of 6.5. And if we run those numbers through the calculator, which I already did, this is 70.6. So I need a flow valve that gives me 19.5 to 17.6 over this range of flow. So let me go back now to my table. So again, I know my CV min. I'll just write that on here, 6.8 to 70.6. Okay, so now as I decide my flow valves, I'm going to just start by looking at the maximum. I know I need 70.6 as my maximum CV, so I can't use this valve, I can't use this valve, and I can't use this valve. All right, so there you go, now I have two choices. Uh, my minimum CV is 6.8. All right, and we want to make sure, again, we want to make sure our valve is open at least 15%. If I look at, um, if I look here, what we can see is that for a 3-inch valve, 
6.8 is going to be somewhere between these two. And for a 4 inch valve, the CV is going to be somewhere probably a little bit closer to 10. So I, this probably corresponds with, you know, just rough idea looking at interpolating by eye. This is probably going to be less than 15% for that 4 inch flow valve. Right? But also one of the things I consider is the CV at my maximum flow rate is going to be between here, 60 and 70%. Whereas the CV max for the 3 inch valve is going to be up here. So the 3-inch the valve is going to give me a little bit wider range of control. Okay, we saw that the uh, pressure across the valve, the differential pressure, comes from the pump head or the tank head. It, so it's above and beyond the pressure in the pipe, the lift, and any pressure you need to uh, overcome pressure in a tank. Now, my preferred method is to make sure it's the size right, is the take the valve, uh, calculate what my maximum flow rate is, uh, look up, calculate for the CV of 80% on that size valve. You get the valve table and look up the coefficient, get about 80% of your CV, then calculate how much differential pressure you need to drive that flow rate through the valve, and then take that pressure that you've calculated and add that to the head of the pump instead of guessing at 20 or 40% of the pressure loss in the pipe, just calculate the pressure and add it to the pump. That way you know you're only using 80% of your CV when you're at maximum flow and your valve sized correctly. Okay, that's about it. We showed you how to size it for the exam and uh, how to size it in real life. Uh, in the next video, Emerson will give you more detail on how to size for the exam. Remember, we don't have to size the piping geometric factor. That's it. Bye. For more information on control valves, accessories, and how to size it, uh, we'll also look at the gain of the system and the linearity and the aspects of oversizing a valve. So be sure to read the book. Be sure to purchase my book, Control Systems Exam Reference Manual, A Practical Study Guide, now in the fourth edition. Go to https www.isa.org slash CSE reference to purchase the book.